Welcome to the Valley Church Podcast. We are here in the basement of Calvary Baptist Church here in Salem. I'm hanging out with two of my best friends, Maddie Beals, and of course, Mark Arima joins us what, this what? week. Nice. What, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, Maddie, we have known each other for a long time. A long time. Since when? High school. Before then, I thought. I, end, end of middle school for you? Beginning I have a memory of, of going to your birthday party, and that, I didn't I was, know you. <laughs> I was just thinking what? about that. Honestly, I was like, yep. <laughs> why is this girl here? I think we had a mutual yeah. friend. Yeah. Um, so it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. And we have done ministry together for many, many years. Mm-hmm. Most recently, you were at Valley since the very beginning at mm-hmm. House Church number one. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy to have you here. Maddie was yeah. supposed to speak... This coming Sunday, were we to be in our normal gathering, which we are not, which is why we are recording this conversation right now, and we're going to kind of let Maddie walk us through the passage that she was going to teach and see what we can find out, and I'll be encouraged and and learn how to follow Jesus better, and I'm pretty excited about it. I'm excited too. I am too. Well, I guess we can dive in. Let's do it. So we've been going through Matthew, and... There's so much that we're gleaning, obviously. I hope you've been able to keep up to date with the teachings that we've had so far. And we are in Matthew 6 today. So we're right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And we are going to start just by reading our passage. So we're looking today at Matthew 6, 1 through 4. So turn with your Bibles, please. Even though we can't hear the page rustles, I believe that you're turning there. All right. Uh, Thank you, Mark. (laughs) The passage says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So this passage is a little bit of a beginning of several passages that we're going to be looking at. Several is in three, I suppose. (laughs) This is um, the first part of three sections where we're kind of going to be comparing a hypocrite and things that are done in public versus... God's way or Jesus's way in his kingdom of how to serve in a much more humble way and things that should be done in private. So this first section is on giving to the poor. The next section is much more widely known as uh, for praying and we'll have the Lord's prayer and that will be next week followed by a passage on fasting. So this is the first verse is a little bit of an introduction, I guess you could say, beware of practicing your righteousness before men. I mean, it starts really broad, your righteousness, which then funnels into what it would look like to give, to pray, and to fast. So the underlying in all three of these really, like I already mentioned, there's a reward, there's man's reward, there's God's reward, and kind of what we're seeking after in our actions. So I think what I kind of want to do is first start by going really broad and giving a little bit of some history. This isn't the first time this has happened. It definitely won't be the last. So we've seen some instances already in Israel's history of what this has looked like. And then we can kind of have that playing in the background as then we go back to the passage and then look at what this looks like for us today. So Love it. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the book of Malachi. So before we just dive in, Malachi was a prophet. The prophets were used lots of different ways. I would say pre-exile, so before Israel kind of crumbled into nothing, into exile in Babylon, the prophets more spoke about idolatry. So this was Israel was continuing to choose other nations, other gods, mixing with other gods. Mm. And so that's normally what the prophets spoke against is some sort of like pagan worship. But Malachi is actually post-exile. So they have come out of exile and they're trying to put their lives and their kingdom back together. And in this sense, 
their worship was a lot more cor- corrupted by indifference and selfishness of the people. So that's kind of the audience, what they're thinking. And so I'm going to be reading from Malachi 1, starting in verse 6. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it anyways to put it in terms I think that we'll be able to understand a little bit more. So at this point, Israel is kind of partially back out of exile, right? Mm-hmm. So they've kind of, we've read Ezra and Nehemiah, and they've kind of returned a little bit, and they've, they're trying to rebuild their way of life, but they're kind of doing it half-heartedly. Yes, exactly. Um, great. Yeah, half-heartedly, I think, is the best way to put it. Sweet. So we're starting in verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant is honoring his master. So Yahweh is saying, if I'm the father, where is your honor that you're giving to me? If I'm your master, why aren't you respecting me? And the Lord saying, it is you, O priests, who are showing contempt for my name. So this passage is actually directed at priests and the offerings that are being given and the level or the awe or respect that is maybe lacking in their offerings. So they're saying, uh, or Yahweh is saying, you defiled the food that was given to me on my altar. And they're saying, well, how was it defiled? And he starts listing off these things. You bring blind animals for sacrifice. Is that not wrong? Well, when you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Would you offer that to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? So these examples that he's giving, if you think back to the Torah, there were very strict laws of what was what type of animal was acceptable because we're talking about a sacrifice for sin, right? And so if the animal isn't, spotless. I mean, there's all of these requirements for this animal. So the fact that in this way, their offering is just like, it's not the first fruits. It's not the best. Um, it's a complete, uh, it's, it's breaking the commandment that God has given. And so, uh, later on in verse 10, he says, you know, I would almost wish that you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar And then later he says, and I will accept no offering from your hands. So I think I just want to kind of sit here for a minute and feel the weight of this. It's difficult to put ourselves in this situation, but think of God's people offering something to Yahweh and he is rejecting it. I mean, that's really heavy if you think about it, because you think, well, shoot, (laughs) What, what am I offering and what is what is the offering? You know, is it, is it half-hearted? Is it broken? Is it, you know, it's corrupted by sin and we know that's inevitable. Um, and we'll kind of get into more of that later of what that looks like. But I think it's, um, easy to just kind of run past it and think like, Oh yeah, Israel messed up. Uh, but it gets really practical when you start thinking, okay, this could be me. So, you know, we have, the Israelites who are offering these empty praises, they're going nowhere and it's meaningless. There's no heart behind it. There's no desire to actually honor Yahweh in their actions. And so going back to Matthew, we kind of have this description of Pharisees. So Pharisees, as we know, they are very good keepers of the law. They are not... um, half-hearted in a sense. They're wholehearted, absolutely. Um, But in their situation, their problem is actually not in apathy, but their problem is probably more so in pride and in trying to follow the law to a T um, in the sense of even adding law, adding Mm -hmm. actions, um, and then expecting much more from God. So in Matthew 23, jumping ahead actually from where our passage is, Verses two and three, Jesus is saying to the people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they've seated themselves in the chair of Moses. So they are very familiar with the Torah. They know what to do and they know not what to do. So therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. They are correct in how you should follow the Torah. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and they do not do them. (laughs) So (laughs) listen to what they have to say, but don't actually... Don't, lo- don't live your life like the Pharisees are living their lives uh, because they are throwing up empty praises as well. And then later on in 23, there's these eight woes, and it's kind of like, woe, 
you scribes, will you Pharisees, for you've done X, Y, Z. And to me, the one in verse 27, so we're looking at Matthew 23, 27, it just hits home for me. I think it's a really beautiful imagery that we're seeing here. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but the inside they are full of dead men's bones and all unclean uncleanliness. So that to me is a image I can hold on to because I think of a whitewashed tomb. A tomb is full of bones as death on the inside, but the outside is clean and beautiful. Think of a whitewashed tomb. It's presented, looks very well kept, but the inside is just death and is brokenness. So once again, we think it's probably time to look in a mirror and recognize what do my praises look like? What do my offerings look like? What does my giving look like? What is the heart posture that I have? And how am I giving that to Yahweh? So in your kind of summary of Malachi and then looking ahead in Matthew, in Malachi, um, it's not that people were um, extra prideful and kind of missing God's heart by adding too much law, um, but it's that they were kind of half-heartedly trying to maintain the appearance of religiousness, but doing it half-heartedly, like they were offering the wrong kind of animals. And But then the Pharisees kind of took it a different direction, and they very similarly were trying to maintain the appearance of very devout uh, following of God, but their hearts, similar to how it was in Malachi, their hearts were not in it. So is that kind of where you're headed here and where we think that Jesus is headed in this passage is that we need to think about our heart in this situation? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. So if you really are thinking, you might have a personality that defaults one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You default to the, I am really good at following X, Y, Z. I'm following these steps in my spiritual growth is full of what can I do to be good enough for God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you might default on the other side to, man, when life gets hard, I'm out. <laughs> I want to <laughs> check out. I like I'll keep showing up to church every week, but I don't have anything to give. Mm -hmm. And you also in your life could go either way. <laughs> you know, that mm -hmm. that could be just different seasons of life. So I think that we can see ourselves in both of these instances. But really, it all comes down to what is your heart posture and maybe the action looks exactly the same, but the heart posture is different and mm. one is right and one is wrong. Hmm. Yeah, that's really scary. That's pretty strong language too when you look at it. Mm -hmm. Useless fires on my altar in Malachi and whitewashed tombs. That's kind of scary stuff. I'd rather you shut the door of the temple. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, wild. I know. Even in the passage that we're looking at today, we have... Jesus saying, otherwise you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. That also is really strong language. You have no reward with your father. And that is really humbling. And that sort of language is used all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. It's very black and white. And we understand that there's some hyperbole in use and whatnot. And what does this look like practically for us? We, we take it a little more practically and a little mm -hmm. bit more leveled out, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But the reason for this harsh language, I think, is to get that point across where we just kind of like, oh, I'm just going to sit here and be quiet, I think, for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I need to sit in this because that's that's heavy. And mm -hmm. that really, I think, helps us understand the weight of what we do. And especially in our culture, kind of snaps us out of this half-heartedness. A lot of times in our faith, it it's way more serious than I think we want to take it sometimes. So with all of that at play, let's now go back to Matthew 6. And we have our two images here that we're considering. So we have the man who gives in public, and they're receiving man's praise. And then we have the man who gives in private, who's receiving God's praise and mm -hmm. reward. So the idea of reward, I think sometimes we shy away from a little bit because we think there's some sort of if I'm working for a reward, there's something wrong with that. Mm -hmm. There's a level of I'm only doing this because I want blessing. 
and we do need to be weary. I think, I think that fear is rightfully so. We need to be weary of that idea that we aren't doing things, um, you know, in some sense, the desire for God's reward can turn into actually a desire for man's praise, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think that even earlier in Matthew 5, when we're reading the Beatitudes, we have that language of blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There's some like reward language in that. The, mm-hmm. These people are blessed. And even at the very end of the Beatitudes, we have um, this is Matthew 5, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. And so I think we don't need to be too nervous with that language of there is a reward for what you are doing. And the idea is that when it's done in private, God sees everything that you're doing. And there isn't a need to be seen. There isn't a need to prove anything to anyone. And that takes off a lot of pressure, if you ask me. <laughs> um <laughs> But when they're talking about when Jesus is kind of painting this picture of the man who gives in public, the Pharisees, they're on the street corners, they're trumpeting, they're trying to draw attention to themselves. They want everyone to see. They want everyone to be aware of what they're doing. He says, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And what this reward is, is they are receiving what they wanted they wanted everyone to see what they were doing. Mm-hmm. They wanted everyone to turn the eye and think that's a really good Pharisee. And so that's why God's like, I got nothing else for them. I have mm-hmm. no, no desire to be a part of that. I have no desire to affirm that, to give them anything. Mm-hmm. And so, th- yeah, they got a reward and they, they need to sit with what they chose. <laughs> they chose to get man's reward to get man's praise. And I think you can even think of it, you can take it one step further and think this actually is no act of generosity. There is no part in the Pharisees giving to the poor that is generous because they're actually purchasing the praise of man. If you think it's like a transaction that's happening, they're giving money and they're getting something in return. And then you're like, what are they even doing? <laughs> there's no, that. that's the whitewashed tomb, right? There, mm-hmm. There's no goodness that's overflowing from their heart mm-hmm. that is pouring into an action of generosity. This just got real. This just got real. <laughs> Hope they got what they paid for. Um, I feel like, Maddie, in your study of this passage, I'm wondering if you could elaborate in like kind of your knowledge of this first century what would their trumpets have sounded like? <laughs> okay. Um, probably something like... Doo, 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 doo. Perfect. Thank I you. think like we could probably... That's like pretty accurate. Okay, great. I mean, and as the time progressed, you know, the audio files, the electronic files, they got yeah. a little warped. Oh, yeah. You know, and like when they were next to the Dead Sea Scrolls in the water, it just kind of warp, <laughs> the warped salt, the sound a little. The salt oh. Yeah. 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 But I feel like I could, that was like a pretty accurate. Great. And all of your yeah. research on ancient Near East trumpets. Yeah. Great. Yep. <laughs> they tended to be gold. <laughs> <laughs> so then when we're considering these different kinds of acts, you can also start to think, so can I do nothing in public? That mm. also seems weird because... There's plenty of things that are done in public, and rightfully so. Mm. There's things that should be celebrated, things that amazing things that God is doing, or how wonderful is it that, like, you can see God's narrative arc in all of it, and we want to share that. So then, of course, that begs itself, you know, can all or are all public acts of generosity bad? And the answer is no. So then, the difference is what would make something good or bad. And that just goes back to what we've been talking about. And that's the heart posture. Mm -hmm. And this is where we start thinking of the kingdom that Jesus is painting. And it's just an upside down kingdom. We've talked about it and we're going to keep talking about it. It is Matthew 23, 12, when Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And we recognize that the desire for my name to be great in whatever I'm doing, so let's take it out of giving and let's go big into any sort of act. My desire to make my name great is my downfall. 
-hmm. Jesus will humble that person. And that goes back to the Tower of Babel when, you know, like that's that's what they were doing. They're trying to make their name great. And look at how cool we are. We look at this tower we've built and how amazing we are. We're unstoppable. We're unstoppable. Yeah. And we did it. This is all us. And that is the first time we see the image of, you know, we see it of this like power hungry desire to raise myself up to be God. I mean, you can think we have Pharaoh, we have Egypt, we have Babylon. Mm -hmm. These are these images that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And every time they are humbled and every time the humble is exalted. I mean, Jesus was, he came humbled Mm -hmm. and he is now exalted. Mm -hmm. So this goes against this core desire that we have, this, this bent towards making something of ourselves. Hmm. And this is where we really have to humbly come and say, I'm laying that at the feet of Jesus because I'm, I'm living in a new kingdom and Hmm. this kingdom is of servanthood. This kingdom is of giving. This kingdom is, doesn't need any one person or any nation to affirm because God's going to do what he's going to do. And I don't need to stand here and parade around because I want someone to say, look at how good of a Christian they are. That's not what this is about. Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of what he says is practicing righteousness in front of people and subtext is so that they can be seen by people. And Jesus says those people like the Pharisees, they have their reward and the reward was that people saw them and that was their reward. And he tells us to um, not let our, what is it? Our left hand know what our right hand is doing that we give in secret because our father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. So, Our giving is usually, well, it depends on the church you're from, but usually done in secret. Uh, If you give online, people usually don't see that. If we pass around a basket, people might see. Um, But how do you see, like, what are some of the main ways you feel like um, we need to let this, like, hit us in the the way we follow Jesus today? That is a great question. I first want to just acknowledge the serious change in lighting we just had. The sun Mm -hmm. was beating. It got, the lighting got weird. So yeah, I had to close the blinds. We acknowledged it. Thank you. Elephant in the room. (laughs) Elephant in the room. Okay. So really good question. What this looks like for us today. You know, we are in this slowed down lifestyle as we are all social distancing or quarantining. We're staying in our homes. But I think this additional space that we have in our lives gives us this chance to be a lot more intentional with our community because you have to, right? You don't know what's mm-hmm. what's going on in someone's life unless you actually ask them. We're not seeing our people regularly. And so we have this opportunity, I think, to be really generous in this time in so many different ways. So generosity can look like money. It can look like you know someone who lost their job in this time or their hours were cut They work at a restaurant. They don't know when they're going to be working. I mean, you, you know, I know people in that boat. And if you are in that boat, know that people want to love you and care for you and be willing to let people into that part of your life. Be willing to share with the people in your community group or some close friends, whoever it is, acknowledging this is what's going on. You don't have to suffer alone uh, because we want to be able to bless you, the people that can bless you. So if you are the person who hasn't been maybe hit financially by this, find the people that need that generosity. Um, if it's not money, it could be your presence. I know that once again, 
this looks unique in our time frame right now, but it could be FaceTiming them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it could be a Zoom community group hangout. It could be a text, but it does require that step. You know, like if you're thinking of someone, don't just be like, I hope they're doing well. <laughs> Call them, <laughs> FaceTime them, look at their face and say, I was thinking of you and I wanted to ask you how you were doing. That is a gift. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you can give that to someone. It could even be your time. It could be going grocery shopping for someone who can't do that for themselves. It could be someone in our church that needs help. It could be your grandparents or your parents that should maybe stay home or someone you know that has a compromised immune system. I don't know what it is. Um, I think it's also important to remember that keep giving to your local church. That means here at Valley, Um, I would say that for any church because the church also, it's not like, Hey, just give to the church because we need to keep the church afloat. It's, Hey, the church is an avenue also to give to these other opportunities. You might not know of someone who's in need, but maybe Valley does. And we have money set aside for those purposes. And so just as you should give generously, um, keep giving to your church. And don't fear the the need to like cling on to what you have. Um, trust that God knows what he's doing in these circumstances. So just think who is the poor and the needy in your life. I mean, that there's so many, so many instances. It could literally be the poor and the pre- oppressed. Um, or it could just be like the single friend that you have that lives by themselves and could really use coffee dropped off on their doorstep or could use a FaceTime or if you're well and you want to go against that six foot distancing, go and watch a movie with them. Um, I mean, there's so many people that fall into that category. You can be surrounded by people and still, still feel very lonely, but, but give. I would just like to point out that we did not ask Maddie to say any of that. But it was oh, great. about, it the, was ga- the, about the church. Yeah. That's true. That was not prompted yeah. by either of them. <laughs> we had a script that we just asked her to read. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they didn't tell me to say that. No. And I, I would like to add on to what Maddie was saying. In our, I think in our last couple emails, we have, so if you're part of our Valley Church family, we've sent out some emails saying, hey, if you, something to the same effect. If you, if you need anything, please let us know. And we realized that that is usually the least effective way of helping somebody Like that's kind of what we say as a culture just by standard is like, hey, if I can help anyway, let me know. Let me know Mm -hmm. how I can help. Mm -hmm. And most people are not going to take you up on that. And so uh, I would like to just ask our our church family at least that, like Maddie said, if you could use a hand, whether that's financially or practically, like with, you know, going to get groceries or supplies or anything like that, um, please let us help. And we're, we are ready and expecting your call, your email so mm-hmm. that we can be the church for you. Um, so yeah, take us up on it. Yeah. And this is even just a plug for community is when you're in community and you're living life with the people that you're committed to, you know, those needs mm-hmm. because it's not even like a, Oh man, I need to tell someone this. It's just like, who out my community is the first people I tell and cause I know that they're going to be there for me. Mm-hmm. So if you feel like you don't have that and you aren't plugged into a community group, please, please, you know, we have community groups and we want you guys to be plugged in and there's so much more benefit. I mean, this is what the body of Christ looks like when it's operating like this mm-hmm. is that needs are shared and needs are met. Mm-hmm. So, Okay, so that's one way that we uh, are going to kind of let this passage hit us and change the way that we live in this season. What else you got, Maddie? So I think that while this is maybe one of the times in your life where you have this complete ability to be generous in quiet (laughs) because there's no people around to see it, you also probably have one of the greatest desires to make it public because there's no one here to see it. (laughs) And our hearts are just bent towards that. So while we're in isolation, we're seeking connection. We don't have that face-to-face, person-to-person connection. 
And so then we're seeking affirmation and we're seeking approval. And I think one huge way that happens is coming through the media of social media. And it's a dangerous uh, route to go through, but it is a little bit in and of itself. The outworking of social media is a little bit uh, asking for man's praise. You said it. I said it. How do you feel? I hope people don't come for me (laughs) (laughs) with pitchforks. They wouldn't do that. They would just unfollow you. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Touche. But you know what? That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're suggesting social media is kind of one of the ways that we um, might possibly be looking for the attention and the praise of men through what we do. So give me some examples and call out some people. I'm oh kidding. gosh. Do that. <laughs> At this person. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm coming from the place of, I have had social media for a long time. I really enjoy posting and I'll let Mark and Michael speak for themselves. Um, we all maybe have a little bit of different, both experiences and maybe agendas in this conversation. Um, but I think there is something really special when you are in a moment, whether it's with friends, it is, um, well, let's start there. It's, let's just make it general. Something that fun that you're doing. The desire to post about it on social media is coming from a place of, I want people to know that I'm doing this fun thing. I mean, that might not be where you're coming from. You're not actively thinking, I want someone to know how cool I am. But I mean, I just, we have to acknowledge it. (laughs) But maybe, you know what I mean? There, I mean, you might be thinking that. You absolutely might think, I want a projection of my life to be forward. You might think, this is fun and I'm just using social media and I just want to put this out there. But I think there's something special in thinking, I can just enjoy this moment and no one needs to know that this happened apart from the people that were there. So that's just in general, but you can then put it into your spiritual life. And, you know, if someone went to a coffee shop to read their Bible and didn't post about it on Instagram, did it really happen? (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) And so there's something really real and I've been there. I mean, I have been there. I know what it's like, but this is where I think in terms of, when we, you know, going back to kind of things we talked about at the beginning of this, it's this desire to put this image forward and that is not what's going on. Hmm. It's the whitewashed tomb. It's the, I am following Jesus and look at how well I'm following Jesus when that's not what's going on in your heart. But we have the ability through social media to put together this very meticulously crafted image, especially on our spirituality. Even if you're saying really great things Mm -hmm. um, that could be encouraging to someone else, you know, the, all of those things are true. If you didn't post about it, I don't know. So you're kind of tying this into what we were reading earlier in this passage in Matthew six, one through four, that, um, these things are good things, you know, giving in this, in the case of the passage, giving to the needy is a good thing. But what was the problem was the heart posture as Mm -hmm. they were doing it for the approval of men. So fast forward to today, it's a great thing to go read your Bible. Mm -hmm. In fact, you should go do it like right now. Maybe right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We'll finish this first, but yeah, probably then Um, then read your Bible. So it's a great thing to read your Bible. It's a great thing to go spend time with Jesus, but it could be a problem if you post about it because it might reveal that in your heart, what you wanted was not to go be with Jesus. Maybe you wanted both, but you wanted to be with Jesus and you wanted people to know Mm -hmm. that you were with Jesus and that you're reading your Bible. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. That's the problem. And it just goes back to the heart posture Mm -hmm. because you can post something amazing that the Lord did. I mean, let's go back to that like public acts of generosity you can post something amazing. It could go viral. So many people could see it and be convicted of it. That could be an avenue that the spirit convicts someone else to do something. It could be someone thinks, 
I should pick up my Bible. I haven't done that in a while. Mm -hmm. And actually I do have a lot of time right now. Um, and that could be, you know, clear of wrongdoing in the poster, right? You know, like you might not be doing anything wrong, Mm -hmm. but you could post the exact same thing and have that poor heart posture of desiring the, the praise, desiring the affirmation, putting up this image, and it could be a problem. And to be honest, I would bet that listening to this right now, you know where your heart posture is. I think that there's plenty of times, you know, hmm, I, yeah, that wasn't lining up. What I was saying and what I was doing wasn't lining up. Or I really did just put this little setting together for this perfect picture, um, even though I read my Bible for like five minutes. And then I start, and then I started scrolling on Instagram to see how many likes my picture got. <laughs> um, I think that the spirit convicts, mm-hmm. and I think you probably know right now as we're talking how much this needs to hit you. I mean, this is one of those topics where you can't make a blanket blanket statement because there are different convictions and mm-hmm. different people I think are able to handle things differently. Um, maybe handle things differently isn't the right word. I think, you know, for some people they could watch this movie and some people couldn't watch that movie. Mm. I think there could be a level of that with social media. Some people know when I get on Instagram, it's not good for me mm. um, or whatever, Twitter. I mean, they, yeah. We could go forever. <laughs> MySpace. MySpace. <laughs> mm. Oh, man. Yeah, we can't go down the rabbit trail of MySpace, but no. that, was a, that was a while ago, huh? Mm-hmm. So I think that there's an opportunity for you to bring this to the Lord of what, what does it look like in my life? Like, seriously, mm-hmm. Lord, convict me. If this is something that needs, I need a social media cleanse or I need to... I need to change something. Be willing to ask that question to Mm -hmm. the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say in my own life, I don't know that there was a moment where I felt super convicted about it, but I think I realized I just don't need to post as much as I used to. I don't have this desire. Like who cares? Who cares if it, if someone knows what I did? Yeah. And I think there's, I think there's wisdom in that. Yeah, because there's also probably there's also probably a very fine line too between those sharing my joy and please think I'm cool. Yes, and I mean I don't want everyone to think like, "Wow, Maddie hates social media." She posts on social media. <laughs> I think you get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, it is a really fine line because I do also think we should celebrate the things that the Lord is doing, and our avenue for doing that for the most part is through social media. But I mean, at the same time, the amazing thing that God did isn't any less amazing because you didn't post about it. Yep. And God will still be just as honored by the deed that was done, whether it was a reading a Bible or going on a missions trip Mm -hmm. or being in a church service. God is honored all the same, Mm -hmm. whether or not, it gets uh, posted about on Instagram and liked by 10 people. Or... Yeah. And maybe your act of generosity, you don't post about it. The person who received it posted about it. And that mm-hmm. is them wanting to acknowledge maybe even that you did something in private. Mm-hmm. And that is even great, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like how great is it that that person was so blessed that they wanted to encourage you in a public setting like that? Mm. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. So the question, I think maybe to kind of wrap up the section on social media, I, I could probably rant about how much I, um, how skeptical, I, I'll say how skeptical mm. I am mm-hmm. about social media, um, particularly with respect to this topic. Um, but to kind of wrap it up, I guess, is that we followers of Jesus should be very sensitive to why we post what we post in general, Mm -hmm. but particularly when it comes to what we're trying to project about ourselves as Jesus followers. Mm -hmm. 
are we, I think the phrase we use today is virtue signaling. Are we trying to mm. signal to our world an image of ourselves, an amount of religiousness uh, that is not actually in step with where we are actually at? Because mm-hmm. that would be the problem is if yeah. um, your heart really isn't uh, as your post describes or depicts. And so um, this this might be a moment for you of like, uh, maybe it sounds kind of silly that it is revolving around social media, but it might be a moment of like, like Maddie was saying, like real kind of conviction and a sobering moment where you realize you've kind of been doing what the Pharisees were doing. We don't have a trumpet. There's no like big metal container to throw your change in, but there's a big wide world of social media for you to try to kind of um, sound the trumpet, so to speak. And Mm -hmm. maybe it's time to turn over a new leaf. Mm Mm-hmm. So what is the good heart posture for the Mm -hmm. follower of Jesus who wants to be generous? Yeah. So I think if you are thinking, okay, so I do feel like I'm a little selfish in my giving, or I do feel like I have this desire. What's not going to work is for you to just be like, okay, I'm going to be less selfish. (laughs) That doesn't work, right? There's something in your heart that is, that is causing this desire. So I think what we first want to do is go to the Lord and honestly repent. And I don't mean just repenting of social media. I mean, it could be anything. It could be like, it could be pride. I mean, it could be others opinions on you. It could be the need to be praised, but it also could just be other sin in your life. That is like bending your day to day acts. It could be, like habitual sin, you know, it could be pornography. It could be negativity and lashing out in anger. I don't know what it is, but anytime you don't feel like your heart posture is right, you need to understand, okay, let's go there first. You know, like what is actually Mm -hmm. going on in my heart? And maybe you're just repressing a lot of things. You're repressing anxiety. You're repressing responsibility. And it's bubbling out. So I would say take some time and be quiet with the Lord. Like be quiet with the Lord. Take away. There's not music in the background. You're not trying to read your Bible and journal and find an answer. You're not trying to like, you know, mindlessly flip to your Bible like this and read a verse that you think is just going to like, this is the answer I've been looking for. Cause that never works. Certainly don't take a picture of this whole thing happening. Certainly (laughs) like, so hashtag blessed. <laughs> so I think spend some time with the Lord and let just the free gift of grace wash over you. And this is something you should regularly do. You know, mm-hmm. repentance isn't a, oh, I severely sinned and messed mm-hmm. things up and I need to get right with the Lord. This is a, Lord, I'm waking up this morning and I want my day to be for you. And these are the burdens that I have that I want to lay at your feet. And these are the fears that I have. And then just like breathe in that grace. And Hebrews 4.16, I love this verse. It says, because we have a great high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, now draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. And I think the idea of drawing near to that throne of grace with confidence is so, so special right after that moment of repentance that you don't have to sit in, oh no, I have been living poorly for a while. You don't have to punish yourself. You don't have to make yourself feel worse about your sin. You approach the throne of grace with confidence and you walk in humility. You live in the kingdom that Jesus has set for us, which asks us to deny those desires and to humble ourselves and then give generously that all then pours out into generosity from your heart as will the fruit of the spirit love joy peace patience and and you start to realize man it's not like i was shooting for peace but i got it <laughs> you know <laughs> and and maybe you aren't even shooting for generosity you just need to like realign your your heart with the heartbeat of christ mm-hmm. and then generosity is what comes out yeah I also, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, 
in that process of repentance and kind of resulting in humility and then, like you said, the fruits of the Spirit, is uh, the Pharisees were acting according to the um, deadness of their hearts Mm. and that they were dead. Mm. And that's why Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs, which we who are in God's kingdom, who follow Jesus, are actually not Mm. that. Mm -hmm. And we actually are kind of in the imagery of Ezekiel. We're like Mm -hmm. this uh, tomb of bones that are reanimating and are be like growing into new life because of the resurrection. And so if you feel a little bit down, like, yeah, that's me. I'm kind of sounding the trumpet of my own spirituality sometimes. Um, That's not who you really are. Mm -hmm. And God is making you new and is in the process as we speak of changing that about you. And this might be a moment where that happens significantly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. It's important that in that repentance, you aren't looking towards your heart as this wretched thing because you have a new heart. Mm -hmm. Your heart was stone and is now flesh and, and is your deepest desire actually is to follow Jesus, but sin gets in the way. And so it's important to work from that Mm -hmm. and recognize, yeah, we are not, we, you know, that juxtaposition you just said of, the Pharisees were working from death and we're working from life, the life of Jesus. And it's only through his spirit anyways that we could do this. Right. (laughs) For sure. Well, that's great. Maddie, this was a blast. Thank you so much for joining us in the basement of Calvary Baptist for our, our walk through Matthew, Matthew six, one through four. And, uh, looking forward to what we have later coming later in the coming weeks. And it's going to be a blast. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You're the best. I would also like to close with a quote from that should be cause for contemplation, a quote from a, mm-hmm. a saint. Do I need to be liked? Absolutely not. I like to be liked. I enjoy being liked. I have to be liked. But it's not like this compulsive need to be liked, like my need to be praised. I don't know if anyone could have said it better than Michael Scott. Yep. (laughs) 